All right, welcome back. It's Totally Drum Radio. And in case you did not know, tonight on Jimmy Fallon, uh, our good friend Keaton Simons, he will be yeah. playing with uh, Chris Cornell tonight as, as they do uh, Chris's new single. So that should be really, really cool. So tonight, Jimmy Fallon, Chris Cornell with Keaton Simons. And Keaton was in Philly the other day, too. Oh, really? Yeah, he's out. He was... I think he's still touring. He's on tour with, uh, he's playing guitar for his buddy Tony Luca. And they were in Philly Tuesday night. And then they were in New York over the weekend. The weekend or Monday. And that's when he, they taped with uh, Chris Cornell for tonight. So, but very, very cool. But anyway, it's that time, Nick. <laughs> Romy's ready. Jared's ready. We're ready. So let's finally do this. And I think the fans are ready, too, because they're calling and whatever they're doing. But anyway, let's welcome to Totally Drum Radio, finally, with no technical difficulty, knock on wood, the one <laughs> and only, <laughs> Romy Dames, Jared Greger, the authors, husband and wife authors, of Cunning Little Tales of Midnight and the keyword, Vixenry. Thanks for having us. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for being on. And, you know, me and Nick, like we when we had 15 minutes of actual airtime last week before we went kaput, and uh, huh. this week we can't get enough of the word vixenry. <laughs> Isn't it fun? It's so <laughs> delicious. <laughs> this week, I know. We we got in a discussion about it. We're like, what should we name our book? And she's like, I like the word vixenry. I'm like, babe, that's not a word. And she's like, no, but I think I'm going to make it. Yeah, totally. And Dr. Seuss made up words. Shakespeare made up words. And even though it's our first, technically, first novel, I decided I'm in league with them. Why not? I can, I can do vixenry. I was like, no guy is ever going to buy a book that's called vixenry. And, <laughs> and now you can go and prove me wrong because now you guys are all about the vixenry. Uh, because guys like to hear about girls, and girls are girls love the word vixenry. It just conjures like sexy little foxes. First, you guys yes, blow my does. mind and let me know that Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show isn't live, and now this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Part of the show might be live, but that part is not. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it's it's funny. It, it, so you guys make up the word. And, and Nick was saying it uh, best earlier where he said when you say it, it sounds like you're saying something dirty. It does. That was actually totally planned. And if you abbreviate it, it looks kind of dirty. If you just abbreviate cutting little tails. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Look at that. That's good marketing. Right now, everyone in their head is trying to figure out. They're like, wait a second. Kind of thing. And they're just trying to visualize what it looks like. They're like, what is that acronym? All right. Uh, let me get my Scrabble panels out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Now, all right, now be- before we really start diving into to, into the, the book and how this all came about, and, and again, I, I really can't wait because – the fact that you guys are husband and wife and co-wrote this together, that's a whole story in itself we have to get into. But we definitely have to get a little background on you two because you guys do have a background that people care about, including us. <laughs> <laughs> so, Romy, we'll start with you. I, I mean, first off, you were, you were born in Japan. I was on an American Army base, so I always spoke English, always had the U.S. citizenship, well, I had dual citizenship, Japanese and American. And okay. my mom is Japanese, and my dad is Jewish from Jersey, so I tell everyone I'm a Jap Jap. That's a different way of <laughs> That's funny. Wow. So, well, that, like, really, I guess, uh, changed my whole outlook on it because I, I'm thinking to myself, you moved here when you were 13, so I'm thinking you had to be, like, petrified coming to this country and not knowing the language possibly and all that, and here you just totally blew that out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the yeah, no, I always spoke English, so what, and I always went to an American, high, American uh, middle school while I was there, um, but it was a little bit of a culture change. I wouldn't say it was a culture shock because I'd been here every summer my whole life, um, 
But the big thing for me was malls. I was so excited to come to America and have all these stores in one spot under one roof. That was like the most amazing concept to my 13-year-old brain. I was like, no, I can't wait to go to the U.S. and go to Westfield. <laughs> Claire's and hot. Just oh. that's what the girls junior high across the world are dreaming of. It's They're the, really jealous of our Claire's and hot topics. Totally. <laughs> it sounds like we're being but it's just the truth. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Now, had you been to the States at all before you actually moved here? Oh, yeah, 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 totally. We used to come out every oh, okay. summer because the Army uh, provides, like, um, Army flights. Basically, we get to fly over for free. Um, so I've been all over the U.S. Okay, so and then when you guys moved here, you moved to Seattle. I did. Um, it was a really random choice. My parents, or my mom is from Japan, my dad's from the East Coast, New Jersey, and they kind of just randomly picked a spot in the middle, and the reasoning behind it was, well, the University of Washington has a good library. You know how many times we went to the library? Like, never. But that was their sole <laughs> reason to move to Seattle. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You got so, I, mean, I mean, if you got to pick a thing, that's not like a bad one. <laughs> but you, you would think maybe you'd know a, a little bit more or, like, want to visit the place you picked it for. <laughs> right. Well, we have visited it once before just to buy a Macintosh computer. Like, it was in the 80s. And I think my dad's, like, home computer cost $5,000 back then. And he was like... <laughs> And um, so he also knew it as, like, you know, the computer place, which I guess it was. You know, it, we didn't really know it then. I guess he was kind of ahead of the curve. Um, you know, Bill Gates and right. Apple. Yeah. yeah, Apple was in Silicon Valley. That wasn't up there. Your dad was wrong. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe he was Jared. Maybe he wasn't wrong. Maybe he had foresight. He knew Windows was going to blow up the next year, and that, <laughs> that was the reason you needed to live there because Bill Gates is about to be the most wealthy man in the world. I like to make train of thought connections, and Jared likes to blow them all up with his history degree. Yeah, that's what we do. Oh, <laughs> uh, so now, ha, okay, so how does a girl from Japan move to Seattle, uh, has a five thousand dollar Macintosh computer, end up going into the world of entertainment? Okay, so when I was in Japan on the Army base, we had a tiny little theater called uh, Camp Zama Musical Theater, Music and Theater Workshop. And they had an ad on a bulletin board for Annie, the musical. And I have the record of Annie, and I played it all the time, and I ran around singing, thinking I was Little Orphan Annie, um, even though, you know, I was a half Japanese girl, didn't have red curly hair. I, the power of imagination. So I went in, I auditioned, and begged my parents to take me, and they took me on as the role of Molly. And that's all I ever wanted to do ever since I got up on that stage and people applauded. I was like, people love me. This is fabulous. <laughs> and so when I moved to Seattle, I just busted out the yellow pages, flipped to theaters, and I called everyone. I, w I was almost 13 at the time. I was 12. And I called and I said, hey, I'm 12. I want to come audition for you. Do you have anything for me? And a couple of theaters said, yeah, come on in, bring a monologue. And that's how I got my start in the U.S. And that's okay to do that in Seattle. It's important to explain this to the listeners. In Seattle in 1990, little 12-year-old girls could call random places and say, hey, I'd like to come over and audition for you. And there was no problem. <laughs> with that. In Los Angeles, who wholeheartedly do not recommend this as a strategy to get into the industry. <laughs> There will oh. be more than to help. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. So uh, now you were you were going and doing stage and, and things like that. How did you end up on the voice acting side? Because I think one of your early things you did, I think I saw, was Celebrity Deathmatch. Oh yeah, that was just a total fluke. Um, my my manager at the time. Um, called me and said, hey, can you do a voice that sounds like Lisa Ling? And without thinking about it or knowing what Lisa Ling sounded like, I was like, absolutely. And so then I just <laughs> went and listened to tapes of Lisa Ling, uh, copied her her vo voice tone and, you know, 
style of speech and landed the role, and it was really fun. Wow. That's funny. And I didn't really get into voiceover again until years later after I'd done a lot of sketch comedy and after I was, oh, I feel like I'm skipping ahead in the story. Spoiler alert, after I was on Hannah Montana and I had this, like, totally speaky voice where I talked like this. Um, <laughs> so then the Disney reps noticed me because I did one of their comedy showcases and um, I started working for them. Wow. In the voiceover world. It was really, it kind of all luck. I mean, definitely preparation, but then all the opportunities just were lucky opportunities that I got a chance to be at the right place at the right time. So, like, when preparation meets opportunity? Yeah, that's and luck. Some, some cliche somebody probably <laughs> had about that at some point. Oh, God, I'm a bumper sticker. Let's coin that. Let's, <laughs> let's see if we can get that trademark, shall we? <laughs> I'm sure no one has to argue. Oh, so I mean, be, all right. So also too, being on Hannah Montana, uh, when you see Miley now, do you kind of like shake your head, or do you go "Go, girl"? Like, <laughs> what do you, what do you I think about? In, I am in total awe of Miley. She just took what she had, and she she is just like a marketing genius. Whoever is behind all that is just sharp because she is going strong and everyone is paying attention. Like, Lizzie yeah. McGuire and Hillary Duff kind of fell off the map after uh, Lizzie McGuire was over, and Miley just carved out this new area for herself in the adult world, and I'm so proud of her. She, well, I mean, she, uh, we can say, is kind of like the poster girl for Vixenry. <laughs> Oh, yeah. See, I want to get her to read my book. I, when, next time, I haven't seen her in a very long time. I saw Emily Osment not that long ago. We ran into each other at a karaoke club, and um, I was actually on stage about to sing, and I hear, Rosie! and then I turned, I saw Emily, and I was like, oh, God, I'm supposed to be, like, the older, wiser person that she looks up to, and then I go on stage and butcher a Paula Abdul song. <laughs> she didn't look older, older wise yeah. at all. She had about two drinks in her. And I was- left. That was rough. Completely mortified. And I was like, Emily, this is how I always envision seeing you. <laughs> but hopefully there will be a side meeting when I see Miley again. And I'll tell her to read the book because I think she would love it. Like you said, she is the poster child for Vixen, right? That's funny. Now, something you, you guys did, uh, I, mm-hmm. I saw, which I, I was trying to find clips of it, and I could not find clips of it. I was kind of bummed. But you guys did as a couple – one of my all-time favorite shows, and that's the Newlywed Game. Yes, we did. Wow, you really researched this. <laughs> <laughs> that is impressive. You're the first person who's brought up the Newlywed show. Yeah, wow. Now, how was it, that? It was it, okay. She's got a story here. It's a little bit involved. <laughs> it involves yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Flashcards. <laughs> Nuts of sleepless training where I would drill Jared. What's my favorite color? What was the first movie we saw? If I were a toenail polish, what brand would I be? Like everything. We went. Yeah, we pretty much are. I think we were half the Nielsen ratings for the Game Show Network's reruns at like three in the morning <laughs> when those were going on. We just would like those three hour blocks. Yeah. We'd watch the same ones twice just to make sure that we were on it. And I would pause the television after the questions. We'd write down our answers and see if we matched. And we had all these plans about how we were going to win the um, the trip to the Caribbean. Right. And so we go on the show. We're doing really well. Like We answered every single question totally on point. The other couples are failing miserably because they did not have my Jewish-Japanese educational values where you have to prepare for every game show you're on, I guess. Um, And so we're doing amazing until the final round when Carney Wilson of Wilson Phillips, she's the the hostess, she asked us a two-parter question, and we got half of it incorrect. And I thought, no worries, we still won. We answered more questions correctly. But... They had reweighted the values of the questions so that the last question meant more than all the other ones. And because 
this other couple who had been failing got the answers to that right, they won. And so when they announced the winners, I stood up. They were like, and the winner, the winning couple is. And I stood up. I was all excited. All beaming, smiley, <laughs> and ready to go, clapping for herself with terrible <laughs> etiquette. Oh. And then they announced the other couple. And I guess <laughs> when I mouth was so explicit and so lip readable that they had to reshoot it. And they came over to me and Jared, and they're like, okay. So we're not naming names, but maybe <laughs> couples could act happy and clap for the other couples and be a good sport. After all, it is just a game. <laughs> we probably were the only couple in history to ever have to reshoot the ending of the game. Due to, due to profanity and lip. <laughs> yeah, that was probably it. More of a crazy oh, thing. Oh, classic. The couple that beat us had just got back from Antigua in the Caribbean, where they were being sent to. So they were not even happy about it. They were like, oh, it's it's there. Oh, well, we just got back from our honeymoon there like nine days ago. No, I mean, it was nice. I guess we'll I guess we'll go again. Yeah, no, that's cool. And so we're like, oh, man. So they probably had to reshoot it for their reaction, too. They are like, oh, I guess we really wanted the second-place camera, but I guess we'll go on this all-expense-paid vacation again. <laughs> Oh, that's too funny. Uh, what did you did you think you won too, Jared? Huh? Did you think you guys won too? No, no, because I'd been paying attention to the rules all along the way. She doesn't like to listen to things when people talk like uh. more than a sentence. She just kind of tunes out and starts thinking about a more interesting story they could be telling. Only when they're boring and talking about things like rules. If they're telling me an interesting story, I am so there. The second you start speaking fine print at me, my eyes glaze over. I get this sort of like, I'm sorry, we're out of the office smile. And yeah, she just kind of punches me, looks at me like, you got this, right? And then just zones out. And then it's up to me. So I got it. I didn't stand up and think we'd won. I knew the rules. They changed the rules in between the seasons we've been rehearsing and practicing for and then this one. So yeah, it was really just kind of a good job, and we aren't bitter about it at all. Not at all. <laughs> We're great. <laughs> oh, that's great. Now, Jared, you, on your resume, I see you are a writer, producer, casting director. So you're like a, a, a jack, uh, jack of all trades behind the scenes. Yeah, that's that's kind of it. I mean, that's, 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 well, they're all kind of connected. You know, when you're a producer, half the time you're a writer, especially in television, because that's who ends up. You know, the Chuck Lorries, the guys who make their way up from the writer's room, they end up being the EPs on all these shows because they're the ones kind of driving the narrative of the programs. So right. it's really natural for me to do that. And then as a writer, I was kind of a – I care about my words maybe more than I should. So then in order to not have a director say veto those words, I decided, you know what, I'll just direct this myself. Just Mel Gibson style. I'm just going to go Kevin Costner, Clint Eastwood. I'm going to direct my own words, so that way if I need to improv something on set, you know, the writer, me, and the director, me, we can fight it out, you know, and then come to some agreement. But, yeah, no, so it's, it's one of those kind of things. Also, it helps when you're married to an actress to know how to direct them. That's really, <laughs> really important. If you want to look at all of the really good sort of sound couples in Hollywood, there's a bit of a trend there. You can only have one director or one actor in the relationship. If you have two actors together, that's really hard. That's really, really hard for those two personality types to last too long. That's why it's like, you know, you hear about Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson. You're like, wow, congratulations, man. You guys, really. <laughs> Oh. Now, what's driving the boat? And the other person is, you know, glued to the mask, screaming, I'm the queen of the world. Yeah. <laughs> that's about right. I suppose a less flattering way I could describe it is, you know, in the marriage, it's more like kind of like a Halloween horse costume. Only one of you gets to be the face of the costume. The other one needs ah. to be the hind quarters. I'm that driving hind quarters. That's, that's, that's the really polite way to explain that. Yeah, that's that's it. That's radio worthy. You know what? I like that. I, I I like that. And I and I can feel the pain of being the hind quarters myself. You know, and I, I don't want to say it's a, a gender stereotype generalization, but it does 
somehow there's a lot of people, and of that, there's a disproportionate percentage that raise their hand when they are in the back of the horse costume. <laughs> it, is, it is gender lines almost perfect. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boy. So, now, being that you are a writer, did you ever think uh, you'd be, like, co-writing a book with your wife? About you mean sex stories? One half, <laughs> one half of the dynamic female erotica writer that is a damsel. <laughs> did did I ever envision that? No, you know, not not really. That never that never thought. You know, as a writer, as I'm sitting there working on my screenplays and you know my great American novel and all that. At no point did it actually like, yeah, you know what's going to work for me? I'm going to marry this girl. She's going to be just a handful of sexiness. And she's going to con me into helping her write this book so that, you know, so that people are excited about it and that, you know, there's a male perspective there keeping it on track. Not, never, never, ever did I think that was going to happen. And I'm I'm coping with it pretty well, I think, actually. Don't you think, Ben? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm strong, and I'm dealing with the fact that I'm half a female writer. No, that's cool. Together we are one female erotica novelist. It's like Captain Planet. <laughs> I think it's the only way. You know, uh, is it that Jack Handy where it's you know it takes a big man to to cry and it takes an even bigger man to laugh at that man? (laughs) I think if I was only say six feet tall, I probably wouldn't be able to live this down. (laughs) But really, nobody's nobody's making fun of me for it, and I'm just gonna hope that that carries on for a while. (laughs) Yeah, I don't blame you. It, but it, it, it's got to be like um, it's got to be a fun situation though. It's awesome. Oh, we're having a blast with it. Yeah, I mean, also comedy writer. That's also important to to point out. I was a comedy writer, which is why this is okay. Because <laughs> there's nothing that is better fodder for comedy than this. I promise. <laughs> so, uh, how did the whole idea of the whole Cunning Little Secrets, because I think there isn't there another book before this one? Right, so there's Cunning Little Tales of Midnight and Dictionary, and then there's uh-huh. Cunning Little Secrets, Bedroom Tips and Sex Etiquette, or Sex Tips and Bedroom Etiquette. <laughs> we went back and forth on it. We did. <laughs> so first, of, first we started writing Cunning Little Tales, the novel, and when we finished that, all we heard from anyone was, oh, you don't make money on your first novel. And we were like, oh, okay, if you don't make money on your first book, let's write another book to give out for free, basically. Um, and it's kind of a companion volume. So, you know, it's the nonfiction companion book that goes with Cunning Little Tales. Right. So Cunning Little Secret is all of our sex tips. It's basically like... It's the nonfiction version of Cunning Little Tales. We spent about a year, year and a half writing one, and in the process of writing Cunning Little Tales, we learned an awful lot about nonfiction material. <laughs> and we decided to share that nonfiction material as primer to help everyone thoroughly enjoy their reading of Cunning Little Tales. <laughs> That's going to be, uh, I mean, Jared, I mean, you're, I can't even say you're taking one for the team. I mean, you just got to sit there and be like, all right, is it time to research? Yeah, yeah, no, it was. By far the best book research I've ever done for anything. Let me just, <laughs> if I can go out there and recommend one thing to people, it's do this kind of book and the research because there's no wasted research. You know, <laughs> right. and everything that, you know, you should need or find or has your wife stumble across, oh, that's research. That's what you notice there, baby. Our subscription to Playboy magazine, nah, that's research, sweetie. No, that's, that's for the book. That's what that is. <laughs> It was funny. Now, I have a notebook in bed, and every once in a while, you know, we would press pause on activities, and I would just write stuff down. <laughs> Be like, okay, I can't forget this. This is important. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, that happened a few times too. <laughs> yeah, I, nah, stop. Come on, really? If that's what I, if that's what you're getting at, it wasn't the worst, the worst gig I've ever taken for for a paycheck. <laughs> Oh, uh, so, so like, how did the like actual idea like happen though? Like, what made you guys want to do this whole thing? 
Well, it started out where I realized I really like writing. And, um, and I've been writing and for here, years. Yeah, and together we'd worked on screenplays together and pilots together. And um, Jared had really taken the lead on most of those, be- or on all of those, because that wasn't really my genre. I didn't really read a bunch of screenplays. I more read novels. So we wanted to go into a field where I felt like I was a little bit more um, of an equal partner in the writing. And um, what I realized when I tried to write a novel, it started out that I was writing a novel about teen witches, and all I wanted to do was write the sexy scenes. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> just be a book all on its own so we started writing um basically just about love love is my favorite topic in the world and that includes sex so that's sort of what happened oh and i had read 50 shades of gray and i oh god i feel like we're gonna lose listeners as soon as i say this i hated 50 shades of gray it was the worst thing i'd ever read not because of the content but because it was boring, like, you have to read in, like, a hundred and something pages just to get to the sex. And even then, like, there were ten pages just about the non-disclosure agreement that this couple had written out. Yeah. It drove I me nuts. I actually started reading that book. Did you? What did you think? I, I, I read up until they finally made it to the room. And it was like 150 pages in. By that point, I'm like, you know what? I don't care no more. <laughs> like I, was, I, I didn't. I, I didn't want to be bothered with it no more. In this room that I care about that is worth what I've been through. So I'm just gonna close it. I'm not even following you into the room. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Totally. And so I was reading Fifty Shades, and I was thinking, you know. This is such a cultural phenomenon right now. It must mean there is a void in the world of sexy books, se- sexy books for women, sexy books for men, something to talk about around the water cooler. I, I just felt like there was this need for it. And right. so that was you know, one of the reasons we started writing it. We wanted it to be sexy for smart people. So something that you could read where you feel like you're actually devouring a wonderful book Mm-hmm. And it's not just trash, and yet right. it still has that total sexy. Suddenly, I can't think of another word other than sexy. That scintillating. <laughs> I'm a writer. I just wrote a book <laughs> with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> no, but vocabulary is overrated. One of the main things too that we noticed in Fifty Shades of Grey is that there seems to be a huge separation in the relationship. Like, there's not. It's a dysfunctional relationship yeah. in pretty much every conceivable fashion. And we would argue also sexually it's kind of dysfunctional also. But mm-hmm. it's one of those things where we're looking at it and we're saying, okay, there's 100 million copies of this or something sold worldwide. I don't want that on our generation mark in history. For posterity, I don't want 20 years from now people looking back at us and saying, yeah, that must be the pop cultural touchstone of that generation. And it just shocked me that this was going to be it. That, this, you know, on the list of things, it's going to be like Harry Potter, Star Wars, Fifty Shades of Grey. And I'm, we're trying to make a book that can at least, if not usurp that title, because that's a long way to go, maybe balance it out a little, just a, an alternate perspective. We just wanted to bring love and sex closer together in pop culture. We don't want the youth today to think, oh, I have to choose between the two. I can either have this, like, rom-com, loving, wonderful relationship, or I can have this dysfunctional, super sexual relationship. We wanted people to see that you can have both. And that you should have both. And you know, in the world with so many downward spiraling cycles, sex is actually an upward spiral if it's with your, you know, monogamous soulmate, significant other, whatever it is. If it's someone that you are crazy about and have a great relationship with, the more sex you have, the better you get at it, the more sex you'll get, the more sex you'll have, the better you get at it, and the more fun and happy you are because, well, you know, it's sex, right? <laughs> 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 I can let the world know that 
sex with the right person is one of the few upward spiraling cycles that there are in the world to really take advantage of. Uh, th- th- this is true. Totally agree with you. <laughs> now, I guess that, like, Romy, did you approach Jared with this idea, or was it, like, an idea you guys came up with together? Um, I kind of approached him with it. Uh, what happened was I started out writing little short, sexy stories, and Jared said, no, 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 we've got to make this. This is really well done. We need to make this into a full-length novel. Um, Because at first I was like, let's just write smut and make a ton of money, just like Neil James did. (laughs) And I was like, hey, that sounds great, except try this. Maybe we set the bar higher. (laughs) You know, instead, we just, instead of shooting for just better than the worst thing you said you've read in the last decade, maybe we shoot for something and say the top 50 things we've read in the last decade. And so what ended up happening is we have a product that we're really proud of and so attached to. It's from the heart, and it is smutty fun, but it's also just so loving. Like, people who are looking for the, for the one, people who have the one, everyone's going to relate to it if they have the topic of love on their mind. Right. Now, how about, like, uh, your family and friends? When you guys told them you guys were writing uh, books of this nature, what did they think? It's so funny because um, both of our parents, they're... Very conservative. Yeah, Jared's parents are conservative. My parents are liberal. They're completely different types of people. They love each other. Um, And they love their kids so much. Like, my parents are so supportive of me. Jared's parents are so incredibly supportive of him that as soon as we told them this is what they're doing, it took them, like, half a second to adjust before Jared's dad was, like, bringing us articles about how romance novels are the best-selling um, fiction right now and make the most money. Um, Jared's mom's trying to help us figure out how to game the social media. My dad left a note on our sexy blog that says, I'm too sexy for this blog. And <laughs> my mom is, like, trying to help us with the graphic design. So they're surprisingly completely on board. Neither of them are not, none of the four of them are ever allowed to read it, nor do they want to. But as far as I was going to say, did they read it? (laughs) No, they don't want to. That would be so icky for them and icky for us. (laughs) Family. Nobody would be looking in each other's eyes. We'd be like just staring down at our plate, trying not to make eye contact, not talking. So, yeah, we're we're avoiding that. Yeah, no, no, no. They're just <laughs> on board with the concept of us being romance novelers. 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 <laughs> well, I made up dictionary. We can be novelers. I don't see why not. <laughs> You're taking this Sue thing too far. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, I mean, to me, it sounds like you guys are kind of like planning like a whole – line of books under this cunning title. Can I tell you the truth? We want a sexual sure. empire. Like, I realize that that is a way huge thought to have at this point. But, like, I look at what Hugh Hefner has and what he did with Playboy. I want to do that for couples. With a little bit of the less exploity nature of it. Yeah. You know. We're both people Bite have your a say. tongue over there, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We love Playboy. Yeah, we, we do. We have like so many uh, vintage issues. They're so cute. They're our coffee table books. Well, and because one of the things that I look at with like Hef and the Playboy Empire that's so unique and cool is what he did for civil rights. He actually was such a pioneer in so many ways, and he used his forum to extreme benefit of a lot of minority groups and a lot of things that needed to be out there. They would get the best writers. And now, I mean, they still actually do pretty well, but there's just that, you know, that cloud of, oh, these are young girls being exploited, that if you could somehow figure out how to just rub that part, you know, off of the map, you know, then that would be a little bit better, I think. So we're trying to figure out a way to not have that pallor cast on it. And we think love, true love, couples, you know, and in that is sort of empowering. Yeah, definitely. It's the next step. Huh. Yeah. Take the first step. We want to take the next one. 
Well, h- how about uh, let's let's go to flip side. How about if it turned also into maybe like a uh, a new younger version of Doctor Ruth? Oh yeah, yeah definitely. Well, what is she? A hundred and six now. So <laughs> I mean, you know, sex keeps you alive. That's the first thing that she was saying back when she started her program in nineteen oh one. But you know. Like, that's kind of true. Like, we absolutely have realized that we're kind of in between generations. We're not quite Gen X, and we're not quite, you know, the millennials. So what we find that we are is kind of a liaison between the Gen X and the boomers and then the younger millennials coming up. We're like the older sister or older brother to the millennials. Yeah. We, We kind of serve as the, you know, the sounding board for their ideas. They're like, hey, you know... We are thinking this maybe is a thing, and we are curious if you have any insight on it. And we find that that's generally who wants to know everything yeah. from us. Yeah. It's, and then we get older people asking us, hey, what are the kids doing to these days? And who do we tell them? So, yeah, it's kind of fun. Like, we would love to do that, give advice. Um, Jared's really great with a relationship advice. Um, and I feel like sex just falls under that category naturally. So it would be really cool to do something with that. Cool. Now, it, <laughs> I'm almost scared to ask this one. You, you mentioned, like, uh, older people emailing, what are the kids doing today? I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, in the world that we live in now, there's a lot of weirdos out there. Do you guys <laughs> get, like, crazy messages from weirdo people? So many. You know? Honestly, because we're a couple putting this out together, like, we, for the most part, our messages are really polite. I mean, if you weren't comfortable handling the subject of sex, yes, it would be a little shocking. But if you are, as... It is actually true. They are weirdly polite. Even though they're, like, really explicit things. And every now and then there's an attachment, you know. And you're like, oh, well, that's something. (laughs) But they are weirdly kind of polite about it. Right, because they really respect the fact that we are in a relationship together. So they realize if they're talking to me, they have to be respectful of Jared. Or if they're talking to Jared, they have to be respectful to me. So we end up getting very respectful people asking really bizarrely explicit questions. And every now and then we actually turn a troll. Yeah. They'll start out trolling us with just, you know, horrible, awful, expletive, film, you know, disgusting things. And then we'll laugh at it and be like, yeah, right? And all of a sudden I'm like, hey, they think I'm cool. <laughs> and then all of a sudden our troll <laughs> starts giving our back and defending us to other people. <laughs> well, one of the weird things is because we started doing Periscope lately. Um, which I'm absolutely fascinated with. It's like, do you know what Periscope is? It's, you know um, what? I, I, I have it. I've never used it. Okay. So basically it's streaming video where you are live and connecting to anyone who wants to. So they sort they type in questions, they type in their comments, and then we respond streaming, uh, and it's streaming picture. So um, we can see what the people are writing, and everyone can see what everyone is writing, and we don't necessarily see it in the same order that they see it. But so someone hopped on and asked me when I was doing a reading of our book. I got on to read Chapter 1 of Cunning Little Tales, and um, as I began reading, someone asked me if I was going to pleasure myself. And I just wasn't ready for that question, and I accidentally screamed, Ew, no! And then I thought, <laughs> that I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm not judging anyone. It's just, I am a lady. <laughs> that is not something that a lady talks about or does on Periscope without any... And I just got completely flustered, and <laughs> suddenly... My title of expert was slipping away, and the funny thing was I lost so many viewers in that moment. The second you announced you would not be doing that. Right. Like, everyone bailed. Right. <laughs> I, oh, that's I funny. Like, right. I was like, well, I'm not a porn star. I'm someone who talks about sex. So I'm not going to have it on camera. That's... Yeah, someone who talks about it with a great rack, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> We used the mood to lose them in, and then I kill the whole mood as soon as I scream, ew. 
<laughs> now, have you gone back to have you gone back to Periscope again and tried it again, or no? Uh, yeah, no, no, we definitely have, um, and we actually stayed on that night, um, and we realized that we can't tell people. <laughs> we basically try to not let them know that sex isn't going to happen. We're like, well, maybe you don't know. I'm here to read a really sex book to you, and whatever happens, happens. Stay tuned. <laughs> that Seinfeld episode where Elaine says, you know, that George and Jerry would go see any movie if there was the slightest chance a woman might take off her top in it. They'd go see any garbage, ridiculous foreign art film if there was the slightest chance of nudity. So 1,000% true. So we try to, you know, keep them titillated, but not, you know, give away anything. Right. <laughs> oh, Jared, were you like sitting there when that happened, like in the background, going, "Oh no, no, no"? <laughs> well, I actually wasn't even in the room. I was like around the corner, and all I heard was "ew, no." <laughs> and so then I had to come and check to see what that was all about. And then she was oh, trying to funny. explain about who the person's feeling. The person ended up staying on, and because I. <laughs> I thought I scared him away. I felt so bad. Uh, but he ended up staying on and listening to the whole story and being happy that I wasn't actually a super judgmental person. Well, you know, I mean, that's kind of what the whole thing is. The the appeal of what we're doing, it seems like, because, you know, you never really know how things are going to be received or what your point is going to be until people start telling you what your message is sometimes. And I guess our message is just about not being judgmental and letting people just talk. Yeah. Because so... So much of this has been allowed to get, like we say, you know, we're trying to get love and sex back together. The reason they got right. apart is because people stopped talking about it. The people mm-hmm. that were all about true love and, you know, religious piety didn't want to talk about sex at all. And then the people that wanted to talk about sex, for some reason, dug in their heels and were like, oh, you can't possibly be a decent person in a monogamous relationship and be sexy. So it was one of those things where we just think people just need to talk and have somebody who's not going to judge them. You, I won't be pleasuring myself, will not be showing up on a regular basis (laughs) because we're trying to not be judgmental. But at the same time, I think it's kind of cool to have these honest reactions without being judgmental. It's like I I was letting them know, yes, as a woman, that is my honest reaction to, to a sudden uninvited person asking me <laughs> to do something for them that I would not do for them. Oh, it's kind point. of a private thing. But I don't judge them for asking. Like, of course, ask away. That's fine. We need to not have a whole bunch of sexually harassing plumbers and pizza delivery men just because they saw it on porn. So, yeah, good work <laughs> on that, babe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's too funny. Now, how about, like, uh, Audio books, would, would that ever be uh, something you guys are going to look into? Absolutely. We're looking into it right now, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> we have very little information on that front right now, but we are definitely looking into it. We're going to be doing a Kickstarter. <laughs> if anybody wants to, just donate it to our PayPal account, and we'll get this audio book out to your lickety split. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Proud Which, fun. Uh, so, so, something else too, like which I feel uh, was your other blog, not the not the whole sexy blog, but there was another blog, like a personal blog that you guys put out. Right, there. Roman and, got married. Yeah, and it was really interesting and eye opening to read because, I mean, I'm sure people think yes. Here's Romy from, you know, she works in the entertainment industry, a little bit of Hannah Montana, voice acting, stuff like that. Here's Jared, who's worked behind the camera and behind the scenes on stuff. They would think you guys have, like, a nice pot of little gold. You're sitting there, and you guys are, like, writing books now for the fun of it. But you guys really explain, like, hey, like, it's not like that. Like, we're real people, and we're we're trying to pay our bills, too. Right. It's that. Especially, I think people don't realize that artists are artists. So if you're an actor, you go through a period of bohemian fun where you have no money. We went, gone through a period not that long ago. um, Yeah, we couldn't buy a cup of coffee. Yeah, we literally couldn't buy a cup of coffee. And even it's hard for myself to wrap my brain around that because I would keep hopping in line thinking, 
I'm just going to grab a cup of Starbucks here. And, and I would just nudge her. I'd be like, um, do you have some sort of golden goose I don't know about? And then we'd pop out of one. <laughs> um, so she, no, she goes from Starbucks to 7-Eleven. Yeah, no, well, geez, I don't even know. Could we afford a set? Yeah, we probably could have 7-Eleven. Uh, no, there was a minute there where we ha- we just had We nothing. had like a dollar and 30 cents. But, I mean, 7-Eleven coffee is what, like 30 cents? <laughs> uh, no, we could have afforded that. It's funny because it goes up and down. It goes up and down so fast. Like, we're rich, we're poor, we're rich, we're poor. We're flying off to Hawaii. We're going to Emmy parties. And then suddenly we can't afford laundry, you know? And it's different because you never know where the money's coming from or when it's coming. Right. So you really have to have the tiniest overhead monthly budget that you can because sometimes, you know, money shows up and sometimes it doesn't because it's so residual based. And it's wonderful because more and more there's there's more platforms, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. So there's more work out there than there's ever been. But right. it all is so much less now because of it. So your your A listers who make twenty million a film, yeah, those guys are gonna there's gonna be less of them now and there's gonna be more people working. But this is a difficult transition period because at least with the unions and with all the rest of the artists, we're trying to find our footing and figure out what the new paradigm is gonna be so that we can kind of plan for it. And I think it's yeah. important for people getting into the industry to not glamorize it, to realize you have to be doing this because your heart want to make art and not because oh I want to be rich and famous because that's not an easily achievable thing that's like buying a lottery ticket yeah. but if you're here because all you want to do is act or all you want to do is write all you want to do is create great art pieces to put into the world then you're here for the right reasons she's here for the right reasons I got into it for the money so I'm more disappointed <laughs> after that than her. I was eight years old, and I looked up my buddy who just did a Chef Boyardee commercial, and I was like, wow, he's got $200 in his elephant leather wallet. That's pretty good for an eight-year-old. And, I was like, I want and he's got Chef Boyardee. And he's got Chef Boyardee. So I was like, wow, well, all right. He got to meet Albert Brooks on a screen test. Hey, this, this seems like a life for me. And so, yeah. And it's really funny because, like, I did, I did Hannah Montana. I did, like, 13 episodes, and – all of my paychecks combined, including the residuals, I did not make as much as I did when I did three days on a commercial, a GE commercial where you could barely see me. And it's crazy. Like, the payments are just not what you think they would be. Wow. Like, commercials have so much more money than you would where you have way more airtime on Disney. It's fascinating how it works. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, you just blew me away on that one. Yeah, it blew me away too. I, I didn't know until I started <laughs> doing it. <laughs> but like, I would run downstairs during the GE commercial because they don't pay you in a lump sum. So we'd run downstairs and we'd just get stacks of paychecks, and we would just sit there opening the envelopes. It was we call them scratch tickets. So much fun because we had no idea because there's the NASA scientists could not keep track of the residual calculators for these jobs. Depending on what market and what country and what showing at what time of day, it's a different number. So we had no idea what was going to be in the check. Sometimes it was one cent. Sometimes it was $1,000. And we'd be like, wow, all right. So it was kind of interesting. But you can't count on that. That's the, the weird flip side of it. So you do find yourself living in seasons of want and plenty. Right. Wow. Crazy. And you know what? Crazy, crazy, crazy. And so we kind of just love it. Yeah. Like when we're poor, we write about being poor. When we're rich, we write about being rich. And it's fun because we get to live all of life and relate to all sorts of different people. And you know, yeah, when you're with the right person, you're never down. Like you really aren't. It's all relative. Yeah. When we're rich, we're going on fabulous trips with bubble baths, jetted hot tubs. And when we're poor, we we're, laugh a lot. We laugh a lot. We're going hiking, and we do like moonlight hikes, or sit under the stars, and go dance in cul-de-sacs. I mean, we're ridiculous. We're children. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great, though. I, I mean, o- overall, uh, rich or poor, no matter what the wallet size may be at the time. I mean, bottom line is, you guys are happy. So. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I wanted to write about that stuff so honestly on Romeo and Jared are Married, 
because I feel like in this time with Facebook and Twitter, everyone only posts things that are really good. And so you sort of get this, like, the grass is greener. Yeah. And yeah. I want people to know what it's really like, what a happy marriage is really like. It's not always glamorous, but it's always fun. Yeah, it's like they always are saying about the people that go in and get diagnosed with depression, but they're actually bipolar. They just don't go in when they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, bipolar disorder people were diagnosed with depression because they only went in when there was something wrong. <laughs> and so they had no idea that, oh, it was an entirely different complex. Oh, that's funny. Wow. All right, so the book, where can everybody get the book? Okay, so right now, Cutting Little Tales of Midnight and Victory is available on Amazon. It's available for Kindle for two ninety nine at the moment. And it is also available on paperback on Amazon. Wow. Actual physical book. That's a good thing. Oh, it made me so happy when it arrived. I just touched the pages. <laughs> Jerry, it's a book. We wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, all right. So, and where can everybody uh, find you guys to keep in touch with you guys and what's going on in the world of Romy and Jared? I- which. You- that's a reality show. I mean, you guys are should be here like a reality show. Oh, we totally want to have a little sketch show or something in the future, definitely. Um, I would say Twitter is probably just the easiest place to find all of our stuff. Um, my Twitter is on your Twitter. It's at the, T-H-E, Romy Dames, R-O-M-I-D-A-M-E-S. And Jared's is at Jared Greger, J-A-R-E-D-G-R-A-G-E-R. There you go. Did I miss anything? Did I cover it all? No. That was totally, yeah, no, that was perfect. Thank you. Cool. You guys had to come back. You guys are a lot of fun. Oh, you're a lot of fun. We'd love to anytime. Oh, you're nice. (laughs) Oh, you too. (laughs) Now I have to get you to cut an ID before you go. I, I, I need a... This is Romy, and this is Jarrett, and you're listening to Totally Driven Radio. And you can throw the book in there or whatever else you want to throw in there, too. Okay, absolutely. Should we do it right now? Yep, go for it. Hi, this is Romy Dames. And this is Jared Gregor. We wrote Cutting Little Tales of Midnight and Vixenry, and this is Totally, totally Driven, Driven Radio. Radio. Look at that. One take. You guys are the best. It's like we're actors or something. Or something, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun, and we'll keep promoting the book for you, and uh, I can't wait for the next one. Awesome. Thank you. you (laughs) All right, guys, take care. Thanks again. You too. Bye. Bye. All right, there they go. Romy and Jared, check out the book. Not even the book, the books. Get them both. The books. The books. Cunning Little Tales of Midnight and Dictionary, and Cunning Little Secrets, Sex Tips, and Bedroom Etiquette. Even <laughs> etiquette. Etiquette is a, like a dirty word, too, it sounds like. So now they need to like combine Dictionary and etiquette somehow. <laughs> That's funny, dude. Wow. That's uh, I I gotta get them books. Yeah, no, totally. 